Hey everyone, today I'd like to have a look at something pretty special. This is Professor Hickman's Geographisch Statistische Universal Atlas. It's a universal atlas. You can tell this is not new, this is quite old. It is from 1927, so almost a hundred years old. I was really excited when I found this. Uh, someone sold it on a second-hand platform and I had to laugh a bit. She was a really nice lady who gave this to me, but she had a bit of a strange expression when she handed it over and said, this atlas, you can see what the world really looked like. I'm not quite sure how to read that statement but it's quite an interesting look at a time that feels like it was a really long time ago but it's something else again to actually see that we have an overview of the content here and the first thing that kind of sticks out is a table with statistics of all the countries in the world and you can see that Europe's quite long and then Asia only consists of one, two, three, four, five, six countries and Africa only of three countries everything else is listed under colonies under the European part so that was pretty wild to see there's also the Americas and the Holy See of the Pope. We're also going to skip some bits and pieces because I don't think everything from the 1920s is worth looking at. But here, for example, at the start, there's an overview of the most important islands of the earth the largest lakes, the highest mountains, the biggest glaciers. We have here the Pastiazza, which is the biggest glacier in Austria. At the time it was 32 square kilometers. There's some climate information. And then this is the table I just mentioned. Quite a lot of details in Germany, for example. It tells us what kind of state it is. This is a republic. This is the president when he was born and when he was elected or appointed, depending on the kind of state. We have the different regions, size, population number, and then we have the capital. So we have, we also have the capitals of the different regions and the number of inhabitants. It tells us what kind of currency is being used, the budget, and what they use, the metric system or a different one, and some information on natural goods, import, export, etc. So at the time, this must have been really great. You could look up anything. Here we get to the République Française and this is where you see the colonies that France had at the time again with the same information as before the governor, size, population, important cities, number of inhabitants, whether they had a port
there's the ink one, so that's a bit of a longer entry. <laughs> England. Maybe we get to Iceland. The Kingdom of Yugoslavia. Here's my home country, Austria. The president at the time was Dr. Michael Heinisch, born in 1858. We have the nine Bundesländer, just like today. The population was six and a half million, it's a bit smaller than today, but Vienna was about the same size, 1.8 million inhabitants. Other cities were a lot smaller, so I think Steyr, for example, today has about double the number of inhabitants and I think this is quite cute it continues the list of Austrian cities all the way to Kitzbühelstadt 2000 inhabitants Bad Gastein 2000 Güssing and Rusto, Sauerbrunn even just have 1000 Okay, but I think we don't want to get into these statistics for too long. So, so America, the United States. And if we skip ahead, we get some information on the state of technology at the time. For example, the longest railways. There was a project, Cap Cairo Railway, about 8,000 kilometers. The Trans-Siberian Railway, Moscow to Berlin, Paris and Lisbon. At the time it had 6,550. And this is here, continued about 13,500. I think it means if you count the um, European part, Berlin, Paris, Lisbon, 13,000 kilometers, that's quite impressive. This is the Southern Pacific Railway, New York, New Orleans, Los Angeles, 6,250. And the Canadian one, about the same length. We have the longest tunnels, the longest bridges, the highest buildings. There was the Eiffel Tower at the time, of 300 meters. And some info on the most important seaports. The two biggest ships of the earth at the time. There was the former German ship Leviathan. Previously it was called Vaterland or Fatherland. And there's the Majestic of the White Star Line, which previously was called Bismarck. This one is also quite interesting. It says the film industry over the last years, the film industry has become most, one of the most important economic factors, especially in the United States of America where film is on the seventh place in terms of economic importance and the center of the film industry is in Hollywood near Los Angeles. 95% of it is in the hands of 12 different companies which I think is quite diverse, quite a lot of them. And in 1923 these 12 companies employed 300,000 people and had a budget of $75 million. Other important film producing countries are the German Empire, France, Great Britain, Italy, Sweden, Denmark and Austria. 
and the number of cinemas was about 50,000 worldwide and I really liked it doesn't say cinema here the German word would be Kino it says Lichtspielhäuser so it's a bit more theatrical it's quite lovely we have some information on telephone cables radio telephones what else do we have here? there's some help with the pronunciation of different places but I think we're going to skip that And we're also just very briefly going to look through the maps. We start off with the sky, the northern and southern hemisphere, the western and eastern sides, And some geographical information with mountains, depths, and a special graphic for the Alps because after all this is a, an Austrian atlas and the Alps are quite important around here. We're looking at them from west to east, from the south, we have the Golf de Lyon on one side with the Mont de Luberon and not too far away from it is the Mont Blanc with 4810 meters right here we have the San Bernardino San Gotthard Pass we get to Innsbruck Salzburg, we have the Venedige, Hochkönig, Dachstein, 2,969 There it is, the Großglockner, the highest mountain in Austria, 3,798 This should be the one in the middle here in the background and if we are moving east, we're moving past the Gros April, Hochschwab, and then here's the, the mountains of the Viennese Rax, Schneeberg, Stuleck. This used to be a great area for skiing, simmering, and the Hohe Wand before we get to Vienna. Hohe Wand translates to high wall, and that really is what it looks like. On the top, we have Africa, Asia, America, and Europe at the bottom. So it's Australia, New Zealand, Hawaii, with the Andes, the Himalaya. And over here we have the Pyrenees and the Alps. We also have the Balkan, Vulcan in France. Not too high. There's the Northern Ice Sea, the Mediterranean, the Black Sea, the Indian Ocean. Atlantic Ocean and the Great Ocean would be the Pacific with the Mariannengraben, so the deepest point in the ocean. We also have a beautiful overview of the most important rivers. 
For example, here in Asia, these are in blue. This would be the Yenisei, Lena, Amo, Yangtze Kyang, Ganges. In Africa, Congo, Nile, Niger, Zambezi, etc. And then the Americas, the Amazonas, La Plata, Mississippi. And I think for a for an atlas from a German speaking country, it's relatively unusual to see America just as a singular. Usually you have North and South America. And there's one more thing I want to show you, because this is also pretty interesting. Uh, here in the Himalaya, we have the Mount Everest, but it says Mount Everest in brackets. This is very small. I hope you can see this. And the so the main name that is given is Chumuluma, which is a local name. And if you look in older atlases, you might also see Gavisanka given as the name for the Mount Everest. For some reason, there was a bit of a resistance in Germany, Austria, Switzerland, to use Mount Everest, which has more to do with, I think, just not being too happy that it was named after an Englishman. So they wanted to use local names and mix it up, and for a while thought it was called Gavisanka. But that's one of the smaller details in here. Right, here we are with the different states of Europe. Austria and Czechoslovakia. Switzerland. Italy, Spain and Portugal. France. The Benelux states, Great Britain and Ireland, Scandinavia, Poland and the Baltic states, and here so very much in really Eastern Europe and Southeastern Europe, so Yugoslavia, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, and Albania. There's Greece, Turkey, Asia, and all of you, Japan, Africa, North America, and the United States and Mexico in detail, South America, and here specifically Brazil. Bolivia, Argentina, Peru, you can see Chile here. So definitely a lot more focus on the European states. And finally Australia. There's some um, demographic information that I think we're going to skip. And we're going to go over here. So again, with this atlas, we're in 1927. And if you think back to that time, it wasn't too long since the First World War. And a lot of things changed in Europe. Specifically for Austria, um, Austria-Hungary didn't exist anymore, the Habsburg monarchy came to an end. And we can see here how this huge empire dissolved into different parts. So about 3.5% of the area went to Italy, 12% to Poland, another 12% to Austria, 13% became Hungary, 16% Romania, 
20% Czechoslovakia and 21% Yugoslavia. As you can see, Czechoslovakia, also in terms of inhabitants, quite a large part, 26%. Hungary 15, Poland about 15, Yugoslavia doesn't give us a percentage, Austria was 12.5% 12, 12 of the former inhabitants of the monarchy, Romania also 12% and a smaller one, Italy. We're also seeing this for the German Empire, and changes in the European part of Russia. Also quite interesting, I don't know why that is, it gives us information on the number of births and deaths per year. Pretty much all countries have a greater number of births then deaths, except for Mexico. And I'm not too familiar with Mexican history. I'm not sure what happened at the time there. But that seems quite drastic. So, one small detail. We're also having some information on people who left Europe and on the immigrants to the United States. People who left Europe mostly came from Great Britain with about a quarter of a million. Then Italy, Poland, the German area, Spain, Portugal, Sweden and Norway. And most of them went to the United States, namely 680,000. A distant second was Argentina with 195,000, then Canada with about 150, and after that Brazil, South Africa, New Zealand, Mexico, Australia, Cuba and Uruguay, all with less than 100,000. So most definitely went to the USA. We can also see this here that in the first decade of the 20th century, we had a massive peak with 8.5 million going down to just about 5 million. And at the start of the 19th century, it was only 150,000 in a decade. The green part down here is people who left the German Empire. And this here, this was new to me, I didn't expect that. I always figured that most people in the United States had come from England or Great Britain. But it says here that 22% of the population have English background and another 22% have German background. So that was quite unexpected. Irish background accounts for 16%, and then Slavic 10%, Italian 7 and Scandinavian 6%. So Scandinavian and Italian make up for about the same percentage. Also, quite different compared to today. The largest cities of the world at the time. The biggest city was New York, with suburbs greatest New York, under 10 million inhabitants. The second largest city was London, again here Greater London, seven and a half million, and Paris, four and a half. Again, this is counted including the suburbs, the Patna, Sen. Number four is Berlin. Five is Chicago. Six Tokyo. Seven Philadelphia. Eight Vienna. 
I don't think this would be anywhere on this list today. Nine Mosca, ten Buenos Aires. Twenty-four is Glasgow, twenty-five Boston, Manchester, Sydney. So very, very different compared to today. Calcutta, for example, only makes it to place fourteen with thousand three hundred and twenty-eight inhabitants. And then we also get a lot of economic information. Production of wheat, barley, corn, potatoes, of beer and wine. Wine, the most important producer was France, after the Italy and Spain. And for beer it was Great Britain and only then Germany. We have this United States, Belgium, France, Czechoslovakia, and Austria. This seems pretty likely, all things considered. There's tobacco, paper production, salt, oil. The biggest producer of oil was the United States, followed by Mexico and the Soviet Union. And we also get to some, well, not quite new technology, but still, you know, not too old. We have railways and how many kilometers there are in different parts of the world. But half a million kilometers already existed in the United States. Of course, you have to look at the size of the country, which is a bit different um, relative to the European countries. But still, that's really, really impressive. In the German Empire, the connections were a little more dense. We have here 50,000 kilometers, and we also have another number here. Uh, sorry, I hope I got this right. This is States, Canada, British India, right? So, 1835 was when the first train connection opened. Then here, Russia, 1838, France, 1828, so all around the same time. You can see the connections were particularly good in Belgium, also Sweden, Denmark. Austria wasn't too bad, but then they weren't really great in Brazil, South Africa, or the Asian part of Russia. Peru also had very little. Albania had 35 kilometers of rail and I'm really curious to find out where those 35 kilometers were. All in all, across the entire globe, there were 1,200,000 kilometers. 370,000 of which were in Europe, 120,000 in Asia, 50,000 in Africa, 611,000 in North and South America and 46,000 in Australia. We can see how much electricity was produced in the different countries. The United States here definitely on a different scale. And quite fascinating, Austria and the entire Soviet Union were almost on par. With Austria actually producing a little bit more. Mm, 
We have undersea cables in 1922 in kilometers. We have telegraph lines here and Fernsprechstellen. I'm not actually sure what this really means, whether it's just telephone connections or something more specific. We have some information on mail. How many letters are being sent every day? How many cars the different states have? And how many are being built? Again, United States, 4 million cars built per year in 1925. And 20 million existed. There were 25 million cars on the entire planet. In 1925. Some information on ships and connections on connections by plane, the Imperial Airways. A relatively dense net actually here in Central and Northern Europe. One connection across the states. And here on either side of Australia. some information on exchange rates purchasing power of gold living cost wages compared to um, before the first world war so 1923 relative to 1914, which I think is quite interesting. On currencies, international debt, the economic crisis after the World War. I have some information on army, etc. And finally, different flights. Quite interesting, Danzig has its own flag here. Okay, so there was an atlas from 1927. Pretty fascinating. And there's some bits and pieces where I have to admit I'm having a hard time fully understanding what's being depicted in the statistics, but I know someone I can ask. So there are plenty more things to explore and learn about. Again, with these old kind of sources, you have to be a bit careful. Um, not everything is reliable, but it gives you a good view into the world back then. I hope you enjoyed looking through this with me. And these beautiful flowers here that we have today. For now, I wish you sweet dreams. And I will see you again.